the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update Hello, very warm welcome to the VAR show the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail today we are going to continue a theme of interviews we have a very a very experienced and successful coach with us we have mr simon macmenemy with us today so for our listeners simon alexander macmenemy is a scottish football manager previously he has had spells as manager of bhayankara fc new radiant in maldives Pelita Bandung in Indonesia he has also been the man- manager of the Philippines national team and the Indonesian national team so without wasting much time i would like to thank Simon for coming on the show thank you and welcome to the show and i would like to begin by asking how are you and what are you doing during this pandemic period um i'm very well thank you um upbeat and positive just looking forward to the return of football i think with as with everyone who works in football they're pacing the walls wanting the game to come back but no keeping myself busy uh reading a lot um joining a few webinars just kind of making sure that I'm I'm utilizing the free time I have at the minute um the free time that my 3 year old tends to give me anyway uh so in between him climbing on me and and playing cars I'm I'm just trying to you know get online and and um like I say join some conferences and webinars and and um you know stay up to date so now we'll move on to a more lighter topic football that is in comparison to what's happening around the world So you know you have managed in many countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines to name a few and uh, you've had the ex- chance to experience so many footballing cultures how are these footballing cultures different you know um i think that's a very long question you know I, I, that's a, a question you could do a webinar on itself on for many hours um the, the beauty of football is that you may not be able to speak the language but everybody speaks football everybody understands football to a certain extent so you walk into a bar in Russia you can't speak Russian and you say the name David Beckham people go oh they they know what you're talking about football i think is a language that that translates or it it, it uh, transcends the actual language of the of the the country you're in so i'm very very lucky that i've got to see so many different countries and i've experienced so many cultures and under part of my job as working as a foreign coach in other countries is to try as best i can to understand that culture because as soon as i do my message my coaching becomes more accurate for the players i'm working with if i understand what their religions like what their sleeping habits are like what they eat then i can start to try and you know uh, play with that a little bit to make sure that they're performing as well as they possibly can so understanding each culture as we go is is critically important to a foreign coach working abroad uh, and that's that's not including the language that's just simply understanding how people live in the different country you work in to to talk through every different a facet of of each culture we would be here all day every country is different as i'm sure you've experienced when you've traveled but to work in football it's that common uh it's a common denominator within a different context but it's it's important you understand the context first so you know like uh, you have worked in so many roles in football like technical director head coach assistant coach even pundit to name a few out of the many roles you have worked in which role is your personal favorite and which one do you like you know like doing I I'm a coach. I love coaching. I I miss being on a pitch. Um there are other roles that come off the back of being someone who has an opinion about football that is sometimes successful, is sometimes not successful, but when it is successful, people want you to talk about your opinion and your thoughts and and how you see the game. Um I've recently been working for Fox Sports just mainly because I pointed out to them that there isn't really anyone on the network or or really on television who knows a lot about Indonesian football or Vietnamese football who actually speaks English and, and can translate that to the rest of the world so I'm in a fortunate situation that that they they're utilizing me for that um but it's it's these things just come along you know you you get moved from a job and and someone offers you a technical director job and you think that it's a project you want to get involved with and that you can assist change um then then I get involved with it and I I started off you know as as an under 5 under 6 coach working with really small kids just on holiday courses and after school courses and you know i I've, i've been through the whole the, the whole pathway all the way up to a, a two-time national team head coach so i'm very lucky at the age of 42 to have done so much and to be able to sit here 
and talk about football at so many different levels. And I think because I have that experience, because I started off there, that's why so many people want to ask me about football and, and how I see it in, at, at many different levels. You know, like for many people, like you said, Fox Sports didn't have someone who could cover Indonesian football. So, you know, like for me, I'm from Nepal and the only thing I know about Indonesian football is Persija Jakarta because Rohit Chan plays there, you know. So, yeah. can you tell us something more about like Indonesian football, how competitive it is uh, to the other leagues you have managed in? Um, well, Indonesia is the most populous country on earth with football as its number one sport. Now, everybody loves football here. So, for, for example, when Rohit plays for Persija Jakarta, they can play at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday and they will fill a 50,000 seater stadium. Fans are, it's, it's, it's their whole life. You know, in, in Europe, it's part of your life. Family is important, other bits and pieces. Here, football is almost number one. You have family, then you have football. And that transcends everything. Work, health, the lot. The law, sometimes. Um, people are just fanatical about football in this country. And because it's such a populous country, you know, you, you, you can easily ha go from... You get a job at one of the bigger clubs and you, you're on social media and maybe you have a couple of thousand people on your social media. All of a sudden, you've got 100,000 in the space of two days, three days. And then it jumps to 500,000 within a week. Um, such is the, is the interest that, that this whole country supports football. And, and being the national team head coach, you, you definitely feel how many people are wanting the team to win. Um, Every time they play a national team game, you know, at home, you're looking at 80,000 people in the, in the national team stadium, which is an incredible um, support to have behind you when facing difficult op opposition. So football is, is difficult here. It's, it's, there's a lot that affects football. There's a lot outside of football that tries to influence or utilize football for, for other means, where either getting money, getting power, getting politi political uh, issues across. Uh, football sways the masses, so you know a lot of people try to get involved in football to use football to gain other things, whether that's power or be a mayor or take over this or that. Um, and it's not particularly well regulated, so there's always so many issues that, that come along with football in this country. Um, but when it's good, it's amazing. When you have a stadium of 50,000 and you're winning, um, there's there's few countries I've been in that have the passion that will match it, and that includes anywhere in Europe. So, you know, like uh, you have managed in, at club level and also at country level at Philippines and Indonesia. Which one do you like more? I like club. I, I love the I love the feeling of responsibility. I love the feeling of, of the pride of representing a country is is I'm hugely respectful of that. But on a day to day basis, I'm a coach. I like being on a pitch. I like working with players and improving things and working on things and trying to change things for the better with national team. You know, you get them. You get them for ten days to two weeks, and then it's three months, and then ten days for two weeks, and then three months. And there's these long breaks in between where you're in an office, or you're having meetings, or you're discussing, or you're watching opposition. With a club coach, you're on the pitch every day, changing things. And from a player's perspective, you know, you play a game on a Saturday. Maybe maybe you don't win. You get things wrong. You're straight in on the Sunday or the Monday to try and improve things. You work all week, and then within seven days, you get a chance to put it right. With the national team, when you mess up, you have to wait nearly four months to get another opportunity to, to get it right. So the pressure is, is amped up. There is more responsibility on it. And, and it's, it's a double-edged sword. I, I enjoy representing countries. It's an incredible feeling. And I feel very blessed that the two countries have asked me to do it for them. But as, a, as an individual, I love the day-to-day -day coaching. I want to be on a pitch every day. So I very much enjoy being a club coach. So, you know, you have managed at two country at uh, national level at in Asia and also at many top clubs. How did Asia happen to you in the first place? Did you always have an idea of coming to Asia? Like many of them say no. that they, they wanted to experience foreign culture. What was it with you? Well, I've, I've been lucky that my when I was younger, my my father always worked in airlines. So we traveled a lot and I, I went to college in, in America. I was there for two years and um, I've lived in, in Amsterdam and Berlin and Scotland and England and Canada and We've moved around a lot when I was young, so so moving around wasn't an issue to me at all. Um, and really, out of the blue, I I knew a couple of the Philippine national team players at the time, and they just lost their head coach. And they knew that I just left the the semi pro coach that I was working was the semi pro team I was working for, and they suggested I put my CV across, and they would 
talk to the boss about me and uh, and he called me at work and just said, you know, we, we'd be interested in having you as national team head coach. And I was working at non-league level in England at the time as an assistant manager. And then I took the job with the Philippines and became the youngest national team head coach in world football at the time in 2010. So the jump was kind of from here to here in football terms. It was it was a, a vertical almost step up. Um, and really, it just went from there. I, I was successful as the Philippines national team head coach, and, and it, it took me on the wild roller coaster that sees me talking to you here as an experienced head coach of ten years now. So, it was it was kind of unexpected. I didn't I didn't plan for it. My background was always in development and working with young players and and improving players, and uh, that was really where I that's the that's why I got into the job in the first place. I loved that, and I kind of fell into elite coaching, and now. You know, I've been fortunate enough to, to make a career out of it and um, I'm able to sit and talk to you about it. So we'll move on to a little bit on the tactical side. If you had to describe your team as a coach, which adjective would best suit them? Um, it's a difficult one to just choose one word to describe your, your coaching style, but um, I'm a Maybe, maybe because of the history of where I've been and, and going into different cultures, I don't feel that a coach at my level can say, right, I play 4-4-2 and wherever I go, I'm going to play 4-4-2. I think a, a good coach, a, a coach that, that understands the context that he works in, goes in and evaluates the sort of players he has and then forms a formation around the players as opposed to walks in and goes, right, we're going to play 4-4-2. So, you guys are going to have to sort your heads out about now having to play a back four and attacking with wingers and crosses. And um, if you don't have wide guys, I mean that that's my my third club in Indonesia when we won the league. That was one of the big decisions we had to make. They were playing four five one, and and really they were working really hard to to build the ball out the back and then get it to wide players. But the two wide players were very young and inexperienced, and we would keep losing the ball in wide areas. So it would go wide. Everyone would run forward into the box, and we'd lose the ball, and we kept getting caught out. So we realised that you know we're not we're not playing to our strengths here. This isn't our better players aren't on the ball too much. We were giving it to almost our weaker players, and then it was breaking down. So I think a good coach goes into a situation, evaluates what he has quickly, and starts to formulate a strategy and a formation that plays to the team's strengths and hides their weaknesses. And and that may be that could be anything, but it's down to the coach to bring that knowledge. If a coach can only play four four two or three five two, or he always plays four three three, then he was never going to get the best out of his players because those players might not fit that that situation. So, um, I, I think it requires a lot more knowledge at this level to be able to go in and evaluate and evaluate correctly in order to make a successful team. Like how you said, you need, you need to adapt to the situation. But if you had to implement in an ideal situation, um, man marking or zonal marking, what would you prefer or a hybrid? <laughs> um, I'm. I'm I can't give you a definite answer because sometimes we've done zonal, sometimes we've done marking, sometimes we've done zonal and marking. Sometimes we've had, if you've got big guys who can go one-on-one and, and know that I can look after the big centre-back who's come forward to try and win a header and I'm six foot two, I'm confident, I'm a good defender, I can mark him out of the game, no problem. If you've got guys like that, then no problem, you can, you can mark. If you don't have big guys, and especially working in a lot of Asian countries, you don't always have six foot, six foot two, six foot three players to work with. You've got to really utilize other other strengths. And, and sometimes that's just packing the box out and not allowing any space for runners to come in. So you can utilize a, a, a zonal, you know, you put your biggest players, if you like, across the edge of the, of the uh, six yard box and then have markers that just try and body runners out of the way so that they're not able to attack the ball but, but you use everybody because you haven't got anyone who's able to go 1v1 so you're trying 2v1 3v1 at the best um it, it all depends on on the and and this varies in cultures you go to it's not necessarily just down to experience it can be down to physical size it can be down to the style of the league is it a physical league are guys happy with one-on-one um again that's the 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 technical knowledge that a coach has to bring and has to evaluate quickly as to whether they can do it and then make a decision that wins. So, you know, like since you have uh, moved around Asia a lot and uh, you have uh, encountered a lot of people, players, coaches and a lot yeah. of people associated with football. What is the uh, quality of coaches in Asia? Is it like inferior to what you have in Europe? Because, you know, like generally we have uh, most of the leagues have 
coaches from abroad coming over okay so is it like the quality of the coaches which are bad or, or is it something like that i don't think it's fair to say the quality of coaching is bad that's it's um there is an issue of going going west to east is easy but going east to west is not easy you know one thing i realized about indonesian coaches was that they would never give me an opinion they would never go out and say coach i think we should do this today because i think this will work because what they don't want to do is lose face firstly they don't want to lose face to a to a, a foreign based coach but secondly they don't want to be wrong because indonesian coaches don't travel very well there aren't very many indonesian coaches working outside of indonesia so they have to keep people happy they have to try and stay in a job and sometimes that means maybe holding back a little bit and not saying what they really want to say the thing with coaching is that you're employed to give an opinion you're employed to tell people this is what we should do this is why you do the job but if they're not going to do that and sometimes it's very frustrating to work with that culture that you know won't give you a straightforward answer because they're kind of looking out for themselves a little bit i think it's very difficult for for asian coaches to travel you see korean coaches and japanese coaches a little bit further uh, spread but certainly southeast asia i mean i can't think of a southeast asian coach that's been to europe or or america or or, or you know possibly even africa and and done particularly well it's it's i think within this region there is some very very good coaches who understand the culture understand the players understand where the players have come from and in which case make a successful team they don't necessarily have the knowledge to be able to work in europe but then the same is true of european coaches coming across and working in asia they don't understand the context they might have all of the knowledge jose mourinho might come out here and you know we know he's a great coach but if he can't figure out the context of the players the the their culture their understanding what they can and can't do it doesn't matter how good you are as a coach if you cannot understand that that basic context that your players are in so um i don't think there's an issue with coaching out here I, you know uh there will always be a need for bringing in more experienced coaches from from Europe if you like but there are still issues with those coaches coming in they still have to adapt to the the culture that they're working in so you know the next question is a bit tricky so would sign <laughs> yourself would get into yeah. your own team right now if you are coaching the team would you take pick yourself up uh no no i i i wouldn't pick myself no i I have a, an extremely good left foot which means I can demonstrate and I've always been able to demonstrate but I I know what I can and can't demonstrate so if I need to step back and get one of the players to do it for me then I'm quite happy to do that I've got a great left foot but my right foot always held me back I was never a, the problem when I was younger because I was the kid with the left foot they always put me out on the left hand side and for whatever reason the coaches I had when I was younger never moved me to the right or never moved me into the middle So I was always the kid with the the strong left, right? Go right out there and go and play on your left foot. So I never uh, I didn't know it at a young age and and I wasn't ever really taught to use my right foot as often as I I did my left. So I became very very one-footed and even now I'm, you know, great on my left hand side but my right side is terrible. Um so no, no I wouldn't I wouldn't pick myself. I I would like to maybe at night when I dream I think I can still play but no I wouldn't pick myself. So you know uh, this will again the next question is again a little bit difficult for maybe difficult for you. you you have had so much experience and success if you have to pick up one moment in your managerial career which would be your highlight of your career which one would that be um it's fairly easy for me to be honest with you the the highlight of my career is uh is really beating vietnam in the semi final in the group stage of um suzuki cup we were with the philippines national team I was quite an inexperienced uh, national team head coach. It was the first time Philippines had qualified for Suzuki Cup group stage for quite some time and we'd never taken points off Vietnam in a competition ever. And we're quite used to getting 5, 6, 7, 7 to double figures beatings off these teams. Um and we'd drawn our first game against Singapore with a 94th minute equalizer. We got a 1-1 very very late in the game and that really surprised a lot of people. But I think going into that next game because we scored so late and the feeling of finishing that game against Singapore there was just this level of confidence going through the team that hey you know we we we're in the mix here we might be able to get something and because it was a new feeling it was just you know there was so much motivation and togetherness and we went into that Vietnam game Vietnam game Vietnam were defending champions 
uh, it was in their home stadium in Hanoi in front of 40,000 Vietnamese. We didn't have any traveling plans at all. And we beat them 2-0. Um, and it was, you know, ESPN called it one of the greatest uh, football stories of 2010. The, the, one of the biggest shocks ever in Suzuki Cup history that we were able to, to do that. And it, it, it kind of gave rebirth to football within the country of the Philippines. Now the Azcals are, a, well, they've played Nepal quite a few times now, Azcals. They're, they're a strong team now. They're, they're beating teams, like they're getting draws against China and beating teams like North Korea. And they're getting in amongst the big boys and really standing up for themselves. And, you know, that game in 2010 was really the, the tipping point as to relaunching football in the whole country. And, and for me to, to be even involved in that, to have been the coach at the time that was responsible for this resurgence of football in the whole country. I mean, I told you earlier, coming from a development background and, and trying to get as many people involved in football as I can, you know, that, that was my original reason for being involved. That's what I love to do. So to be able to do it on a national scale where you, you assist the relaunching of football that affects millions of people. And when I went back to the Philippines, you had dads. When I went back as a club coach, probably five, six years after Suzuki Cup, I had fathers coming over to me and just saying, Look, I just really wanted to thank you for all your efforts for the national team. My son loves football and he, I know that he loves football because of what you did back in 2010. I mean, those, those are the things that, you know, you remember for the rest of your life. And if I, if I'm never successful again, you know, I can be happy at the end of my career knowing that I've affected a country in that way. It's a, it's a very, very, very proud thing for me and I, and I would be very, very lucky to get anywhere near it again. So uh, again, this uh, the next question is more related to your experience and the success you've had. Do you have any words of advice for young coaches who are just starting out? Coach as often as you can. You know, um, it takes a long time to get to a point where you can earn a salary and you can you can live well from coaching. And you need a lot of luck along the way and you need people to believe in you, but you need experience. Now, I, you can go two ways. You can either go and get all the qualifications and then go and try and coach, or you can coach everything, anywhere, as often as you can for free, just getting as much experience as you possibly can. Because sometimes now, even as a national team coach, or you know, when things go wrong with the Indonesian national team, I had a training session planned you know, to, to a pro license level, had it all out on a piece of paper, had a meeting before to discuss it with the coaches. Then when we got onto the pitch, as we're warming up, only one goalpost was available. We couldn't use the other goalpost. So my whole training plan goes out the window because the whole training plan was based on playing small-sided games with two goalposts. Now we can't use a goalpost. So now I'm having to think, right, okay, I'm in the training session. I don't have time to, to go home and plan. How can I, this is a national team training session. There's cameras over here from the media. Now I think because my background is with kids, working in schools where we have two balls and six cones and a dog runs in on the pitch in the middle of the game. You know, you're dealing with these things all of the time. The experience I have of working at those lower levels, it means that when something like that happens at the highest level, okay, we'll just change the session. No problem. Don't worry about that. We'll use one goal and we'll play two teams playing. To, we'll, we'll change the scenario. It's not a problem. I don't get flustered. I don't start arguing. I don't, wow, what is this? This can't be national team. We've only got one goal post. Okay, we just we just change this. This is what we'll do. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, you come over here. We'll do this. We we'll just bring that over here. We'll do that. That comes from the experience, and that comes from working at, at the lower levels of coaching, at grassroots level, coaching school teams and under fives, and 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 just dealing with anything and everything that's thrown at you, and still trying to make the session flow. Once you then get to to national team level, it becomes very easy. You become a coach that's very easy to work with, very professional, isn't flustered by anything and is very credible in front of players, which at this level is, you know, of the utmost importance. So my, my, my biggest advice is just coach as often as you can. Don't ever turn it down. If someone asks you to coach and you've got time to do it, go and do it. Under five girls, you know, uh, under 12s, um, a group of friends getting together, uh, whoever, go and coach. Doesn't matter if there's payment. The payment will come if you're good, but just go and coach as often as you possibly can. Get that experience. So on that note, I'll ask you one final question, Simon. Is sure. a very controversial kind of people say. <laughs> a very controversial kind of question. Yeah. Whom do you prefer, Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I 
if I was a manager and someone gave me an open checkbook and I had to sign one of those two players, I would sign Ronaldo. That's not to say that I enjoy watching him more. As a purist, you know, you can't fault, you, you can't not be entertained by what Messi does. He's, he's a, he was born to do that. He was always a good player. He was always the best. He was always one of these guys at, at you know, eight, nine, ten years old, just a prodigy. Ronaldo's had to work to get to that point. And I can respect that as a coach, how often he's had to be on a training ground, what he's had to put in to get to even being compared with Messi, to get to that level. So as a coach, I would rather the guy that has built himself into one of the greatest in the world, as opposed to always been born as one of the greatest in the world. I think you've got, you know, that that idea of, of building yourself or, or just, you know, being, if you like. Um, and really, when it comes down to it, if you look at statistics, I, I think that Ronaldo on his own gives you more than Messi on his own. You put Ronaldo into a bad team, he still scores his goals. You put Messi into a bad team, does he still get his goals? Does he still give you value for money? Does he need other players around him to, to look as good as he does? We won't know until he leaves Barcelona, but Ronaldo's had the, the, the guts to do it. He's done it pretty much everywhere he's been and he's still been as good as he is. So, um, you know, I'm not a gambling man. I'm not very good at gambling, but so I would, I would have to go with the statistics and go with Ronaldo. Which club do you support like in Europe? I'm a Celtic fan. Uh, my, my family are from, from just outside of Glasgow and, and Catholics. So, um, it's always been in the family. My dad used to go as a youngster and whenever I go home, I try and, I try and catch a game. Uh, whenever I go back up to Scotland, we try and get tickets for Celtic and uh, my wife loves it. She loves coming to Celtic Park as well. So yeah, I've always been a Celtic fan. So hopefully you'll make it 10 in a row next year. Let's hope so. I mean, I'm glad we got it this year. Uh, it was a bit touch and go for, for a minute. I think the whole season was going to be wiped out. And this, I mean, how they, it, it's, it's really interesting being a foreign coach out here and looking back at the UK and just looking at some of the issues that people are so, you know, it almost, it, 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 it fills their day, this, this hatred or this argument or this, and, and then you come out to Asia and you see some of the things that people go through in other countries and you understand different cultures and, you know, there's people on the streets here with nothing and selling newspapers in bare feet and, you know, you, that really puts it into context just how ridiculous some of the arguments you you get yourself you find yourself embroiled in when you're back in the UK. You know, it's it um, travel really opens your eyes, and working within football does so too. You know, having to understand the culture you work in. So um, it amazes me these these arguments and, and how badly the league messed up and how much controversy it was. It was getting to the point. It was I follow it all on Twitter, and it's just. It's laughable. I ended up turning it off in the end, but I, I'm a fan, so I'm glad that Celtic won the league, and, and hopefully we can push on and get that ten. So you know, like, uh, do you get do you get offers, or do you have plans to go back to UK and coach? Um, I don't really get offers because I think that, like we said before, there is an issue with credibility going east to west. Coming west to east is possible because you're working in a good league, you know, you, you, you have some good names on your CV, whatever. You come and pick up a team in Asia or Southeast Asia. That's doable. But going the other way, going from Southeast Asia specifically back to Europe, there's an issue there because the people that are hiring in Europe, they don't understand Southeast Asian football. They don't understand Asian football. They don't know what, they want, what Nepal play football, really? Do they even have a national team? This is what people think back home. So when you try and explain what the Philippines was like or what Indonesia was like or playing in Suzuki Cup semi-finals, they, they just, oh, oh really? So there's a real issue of credibility going back and it makes it very difficult to make that step back into Europe. You, the realistic goal for me is, a, is to try and, I'd love to go back and work in Europe. I don't really feel the need to go back and work in the UK or, or England. I don't, I'm not really bothered. Um, but I would like to go back and work in Europe, maybe Germany, France, Italy, Spain, you know, somewhere like that would be, would be fascinating to go and, to go and understand European culture a bit more. Um, but I think that I'd have to get a few more names on my CV before I can even be, be a contender for a job back there. So on that note, Simon, thank you so much for talking to us and we wish you all the best for your future. Hope, hopefully, uh, Celtic make it 10 in a row. <laughs> Never know because they're saying so. it's nine and a half. 
half, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're sounding like a Rangers fan now. Don't do no, that. No, no, no. I, I don't sound... I'm, I'm, I, I'm just seeing what happens on Twitter and on social media. Like, yeah. nine star or something, some adjectives and words they were taking out. So, hopefully you manage Celtic one day and take them to 10 in a row for, on yourself. So, thank you for talking that to would me. Be, that would be a dream. You're very welcome, my friend. You stay safe.